way, and I remember us elbows and everything into the instrument panel trying to save everything, and Jim Irwin and I being sitting there saying, God, we sure didn't expect this to happen because that's something you can't do in simulation. Looking over at Dave, and Dave said, yeah, geez, I forgot to tell you guys about that. Modifications of the lunar module greatly extended the time that could be spent on the moon. The astronauts' spacesuits were also updated. These improvements, along with the new lunar roving vehicle, allowed for extra EVA. The rover, folded and stored in the lower part of the lunar module, was an electric four-wheel drive car that allowed the astronauts to travel an area ten times that of the previous mission. The vehicle had a top speed of seven miles per hour and a battery capable of holding a charge for 55 miles of use. Scott and Irwin traveled 17 miles and gathered 170 pounds of samples, including the so-called Genesis rock, one of the oldest rocks brought back. Like Shepard, Scott put on a demonstration for the earthbound audience. His presentation was of a more scientific nature, however. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Even after returning to Endeavour, the crew continued to break new ground. They launched the first satellite from a manned spacecraft, and Al Worden became the first person to perform EVA in deep space. His spacewalk lasted 38 minutes as he retrieved film from cameras located outside the spacecraft. The mission ended on August 7, 1971. The splashdown was rougher than normal due to a failed parachute, but the crew was in high spirits as they wouldn't be entering quarantine as the other astronauts had. It was time for John Young to get his chance. Young had remained in the command module during Apollo 10 while Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan circled the moon. Now as commander of Apollo 16, he and lunar module pilot Charlie Duke were scheduled to land Orion on the central lunar highlands of Descartes. Ken Mattingly, who had been bumped from Apollo 13, stayed behind on Casper. Oh, Houston, uh, Sweet 16 has arrived. They almost didn't get to land. After the separation of Casper and Orion, the command module developed a vibrational problem. This was caused by a malfunction of the backup steering system. Under NASA rules, both primary and backup systems were to be operational for lunar landing. Casper and Orion rendezvoused and orbited in formation while the problem was solved. For me, the most exciting moment was the actual landing on the moon. As a pilot, it was uh, the most dynamic. You're coming in to land in a place you'd never landed before. You weren't really sure the slopes of the terrain and, and, uh, and, the, and the, uh, how this thing was going to handle when you got down low. Even though we were the fifth and we had all of the experience of the prior missions, uh, it was still a new landing area. And so to me, the landing was the, uh, uh, on the moon was the most exciting. Wow! Oh, man! Oh, Ron is finally here, Houston. Fantastic! During the mission's three EVAs, Young and Duke set up ten lunar surface experiments. The most important of these was the far ultraviolet camera and spectroscope. This mechanism took advantage of the lack of lunar atmosphere to collect UV rays emitted from celestial objects, including the Earth. Young also rough tested the lunar rover for the benefit of NASA's engineers while Duke filmed the proceedings. Man, you are really bouncing. Is he on the ground at all? Yeah, that's 10 kilometers. Huh? He's got about two wheels on the ground. Okay, turn sharp. <laughs> I have no desire to turn sharp. <laughs> okay, here's a sharpie. Hey, that's great. He's a big rooster tail out of all four wheels. And as he turns, he skids. The back end breaks loose just like on snow. 
Come on back, John. Hey, the deck is running. Then I'll tell you, Indy's never seen a driver like this. Okay, when he hits the craters and starts bouncing, it's when he gets his rooster tail. He makes sharp turns. Seven and a half months after Orion lifted into the lunar darkness, Apollo 17 became the only night launch of the program. Gene Cernan, like John Young on the previous mission, would finally have an opportunity to walk on the moon. Apollo 17's target was Taurus Littrow on the southeast corner of the Sea of Serenity. With Cernan in the lunar module Challenger was geologist Jack Schmidt, the first professional scientist to visit the moon. Above them, command module pilot Ron Evans maintained the equipment aboard America. Apollo 17 was to be the crowning achievement of the program, and the crew did not disappoint. Theirs was a record-setting mission. At 12 days, 13 hours, and 51 minutes, it was the longest voyage. It was the longest time spent on the surface of the moon, and the longest spent on EVAs. Cernan and Schmidt left Challenger for three work periods, each time for more than seven hours. They traveled 21 miles in the third lunar rover. And they returned with a record load of moon material, 243 pounds. Scattered throughout these accomplishments were the same periods of playfulness that had been part of the previous moonwalks. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of oh, December. Now, May. May. May is the month. May, that's right. May is the year of the month. Each flight had a, and each part of every flight was special, I think, for each one of us. I suppose uh, if you want to zero in on, on something that people get more interested in is the fact that when that engine lights, when you lift off the surface of the moon, you're a long way from home and a lot of things got to happen, but at least you're beginning to, in spite of the fact that you had a good time, you're at least headed in the right direction. At 5.55 p.m. on Thursday, December 14, 1972, Challenger lifted from the surface. Humans would not return for the remainder of the century. Twelve men spent a total of 80 hours and 